Cougs house. All right, the Houston Cougars have wrapped up their exhibitions in Summer League. Really, really impressive performances. Let's jump on in and talk about some Cougar basketball. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, the daily podcast of your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Andrews, that'll break down all things Cougs. If you're a U of H fan or just a hater can't stop by, please be sure to subscribe down below. That way you can lay us on the Cougs in your news feed each and every day. Then we get you the latest on the Cougs each and every day. We appreciate you making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. Uh, welcome back to the YouTube channel. It is good to see you again. Uh, we're going to be talking all things Houston Cougar basketball today. Remember, doing a giveaway every 250 subscribers on YouTube for the moment uh so hit subscribe down below like and comment on the video to let us know you're in the contest if after talking this through about Hughes cougar basketball you have no idea what to say or you miss las vegas summer league or you just want to talk football and that's not what we talked about today tell us in the comments down below whether you like sweet or salty stuff in your trail mix all right so today's episode is gonna be breaking down some key performances and key cougars from the las vegas summer league um if you were not paying attention happens every year that the nba teams send uh, a lot of their younger guys to las vegas to all play one another and the star of the show in many many ways was one marcus sasser so we're gonna start with marcus sasser here at the top then we'll talk with tony from locked on pacers about jared walker talk with uh, adam uh, from or sorry then we talk with jackson about nate hinton and then uh, talk with adam about armani brooks Lots of good Cougar basketball to talk about. So let's start with Marcus, who scored the uh, Las Vegas Summer League high for this season. 40 points in his fifth game as a Detroit Piston. It was great to see him out there. Uh, just one missed second half. You know, he started off over five, finished with 40 points, just one second half missed. And uh, really just dominated in a way that I think we all know he could offensively in this kind of environment. Summer League is known for more like pickup game type flow, a lot of looser type offenses, very simple actions, nothing too complex. Defenses haven't done a whole lot of scouting, right? Um, and so through that, I mean, you may be the fourth or fifth game, you might know something, but certainly not the first couple. And so through that, I think we got to see kind of a looser Marcus in a lot of ways. Uh, took great shot from a quality perspective throughout the entire five game sample, but really didn't make the percentages we're used to until we got to see him uh, in that final game against Indiana. And again, he had 40 points on 25 shots, five of nine from behind the arc. Uh, also added in five assists, three rebounds and a steal. Um, big, big time performance from Marcus. And a couple things stuck out for me on this one with Marcus. One, um, was this personal with Isaiah Wong? Isaiah Wong from the University of Miami. Obviously, that's team that knocked out Houston Sweet 16 last year. He was a starting guard for Indiana on the other side. Maybe. Maybe it was personal. But the other thing I think was interesting in looking at this is, um, honestly, in Detroit Piston Twitter, trying to, you know, some great follows in there. Uh, there's, oh, is it down there? No, down there. Um uh, Locked on Pistons. Ku does a great job over there. Uh, James Edwards does a great job for the Athletic. Like, got a lot of good Pistons coverage. But I think there were some questions. Like, I thought we got a score, and he was having trouble making baskets. And to see him flip that switch in the final game of Summer League, like, no, no, he can make baskets. He just had a bad week of shooting. It was really impactful. He did it in all kinds of ways, coming off of pick and rolls. He did it in catch and shoots, trailing behind the play, leading the fast break, did all kinds of different ways across the game. Again, he had 40 of the team's 100 points. I'm not great at math. That's about 40%, right? Yeah, yeah, 40%. Um, and it was cool, cool to see. What's interesting in looking at that is, A, anytime we can watch Marcus Astor 40-piece, I'm encouraging you to go watch it. Um, awesome to see. But also, B, does that help solidify where he fits in with this Detroit Piston basketball team? They drafted Asar Thompson at the top of the first round. He is a six, 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 seven, long, bouncy creator type, can be some point guard. They have Cade Cunningham, who was the first overall pick a few years back. Uh, he is a six, six, long point guard type. Uh, they also sent Jaden Ivey to Summer League this summer. You saw him out there in some of the earlier games. He's more like a 6'3", 6'4", but a long, you know, 
more of a off ball guard, maybe type. And then Marcus Sasser fits in here somewhere. Right. Um, I think the interesting is that Marcus Sasser clearly, I think over the course of summer league, especially with this 40 piece at the end solidified that he is at least the fourth person there. Right. You've got uh, the defense was tremendous. It was as good as anyone's. You've also got bluntly uh, the 40 piece at the end, like as good as Ivy or Asar played, they didn't have scoring outputs like that. Right. And then the other thing I think that we'll understand is as they get into more traditional NBA basketball, reading a defensive scouting report from Monty Williams, who's a great head coach Marcus gets to play under there in Detroit, or you know, executing an offense and those kinds of things, uh, more complex actions and stuff like that. Those are all things that Marcus is, more, is ready for as a rookie after spending four years with Kelvin Sampson and the University of Houston. Um, for instance, like, I don't quite have the analytics here because that's not quite as well tracked in summer league basketball, but he was clearly the best perimeter defender on Detroit, you could see that when they played different teams by the second and third quarters, they're putting Marcus Sasser on the other team's best uh, scoring from outside threat, even when they played like Anthony Black and Orlando, and it was not a great size matchup, right? Anthony Black is 6'7", Marcus is closer to 6'3", and that's like not the best matchup from a size perspective. Detroit had to go with Marcus on him because no one else could guard him and they might as well give up a few inches and have a good defender on him, right? So those kinds of moments to me make me feel like he's solidified his way into that rotation. What I will find interesting is I bet he starts the year as more as a six man, kind of works his way up um, for Detroit. But suddenly, like, J.D. Ivy's got to start to put together. Tremendous athlete, gifted score. I'm not saying he's not. But there's a lot of other things to the basketball game that Marcus Satch does very well. And I'll be interested to see how that ties to what Detroit's doing. I love the pairing with him and Asar, or I guess three, three of them. Uh, with he, Asar, and Cade, though, because Asar and Cade are both longer, taller. And so Sasser gets to cover the shortest starter on the other team because Cade and Asar can guard those six, seven, six, eight guys without giving up any height difference, right? Really, really excited for that. Really, really excited and f- somewhat relieved to see Sasser finish with the 40 ball. Um, ton of fun, which you got to see Jarrett Walker play and uh, <laughs> play in that game. He played the other uh, first handful of four games. And we're going to bring on Tony East in a second to talk about what Jarrett looked like for the Indiana Pacers in their summer league debut. But first, let's talk a little bit about our buddies at linkedin now linkedin is the best place to find a new hire and these days every potential new hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business you want to be 100 percent certain you have access to the best qualified candidates available that's why you have to check out linkedin jobs linkedin jobs helps find the right people for your team faster uh, if you can find a guy that can get a 40 ball for you in summer league do it if you can find a guy that's a lottery pick kind of caliber guy like jarris walker Take them and you can do it at LinkedIn Jobs. I'm telling you, that's where you can get it done. LinkedIn Jobs, should you find the quad pack candidates you want to talk to faster? Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And we are joined by, I guess, if you've been following the NBA draft at Locked on Cooks for a while, I might be a familiar face at this point, Tony East to talk all things Jarris Walker and the Indiana Pacers. Tony, after Summer League, how are you doing? Oh, great. It's weird. It's like the NBA goes from finals to draft to free agency to summer league. So it's like so on and everyone's really into it. And then when summer league ends, there's nothing for half of us. So it's just like this crazy <laughs> fast switch in my life where I go from like a ton of stuff to enjoy every day to no NBA at all. So it's crazy how quick it changed. But I'm good. I'm good. I'm enjoying the <laughs> first couple of days away. And then not that this is a WNBA pod, but you're also doing stuff with the fever. So you're always yeah. staying busy. Okay. Um Cool, cool stuff there. Were you in Indiana covering the fever or were you out in Vegas covering some of what, what were you? How are you doing all, I, all of the things right now? Well, it did work out that the W all-star break coincided with the early parts of summer league. So I didn't actually, I didn't miss much fever with all that, but uh, yeah, it's still hectic and the W restarts tonight. So the actual <laughs> basketball break in my life doesn't exist, but the NBA decline has come at the same time. Are there any Houston players in the W? I don't think so. Are there? Uh, not currently. Uh, we've been doing a little bit of rebuilding on the women's side of things lately. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'll put it, I'll put it that way. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> um, but let's talk about the men's side of things because Jairus Walker was the highest drafted Houston Cougar since Hakeem Olajuwon, right? Um, 
and he ended up on the Indiana Pacers. He d- didn't end up there at seven, but in a swap, ended up there at eight. Close and um, that's pro- I'd imagine you'd consider that just clever working because we talked about how he might have been a great fit at seven. It's not a whole lot different. Um, and then Summer League happens, and I think a lot of the world got to see Jairus walk in a little bit more space. Um, what were your first impressions or takeaways in watching him in a Pacers uniform for a couple weeks? Yeah, the, some of the stuff that we talked about when you were kind enough to talk about his time at Houston was – that defensive activity and his ability to just be around and blow up plays by himself. Like right away, you could tell that he could do that in the NBA. And that really stood out just because you never know what these guys are going to be like in their first pro setting when the the court dimensions are a little different and the spacing is way different and the guys are a little faster and the shooting is a little better. No problem for him. Uh, He was all over the place. He was in the right spots. He could get around the play. He could be effective on that end. The part that did jump out, and and we talked about this too, is like you knew you could play make a little bit, right? He showed the flashes of that as a passer, but really too, when I talked to his high school coaches after the Pacers drafted him, they're like, okay, for us, he played point guard one year, he played center one year, like we think he can do a little bit of everything on offense. Is that I think in the first Pacers game he had four assists. I can't remember exactly what it was. I have his full five game stats up in front of me, but not the first game specifically. But it was that playmaking part of it, right? They put the ball in his hands and even if he couldn't make the shots within a half second, he's making the right decision, whether that's put it on the floor, make the right pass, make a read. That was the part that jumped out to me is not only did his basketball IQ shine on defense, it applied to offense as well when he was making some of those decision-making plays that give him a lot of upside on that end of the floor. Well, and I think the versatility was interesting because the discussion of Jairus Walker's offense looked like a roller coaster to me in the Twitter world and fan world and all those kinds of things, because he did so many different things than he was ever asked to do directly at Houston, right? He might have two assists in a single game at Houston, but they were both eye poppers. Whereas he did a little more creation and stuff like that with Indiana, but he also uh, bluntly shot the ball better at Houston. (laughs) So as you watched it, what's the guys, a couple things that like he needs to work on or get more adjusted to as NBA games approach in October. Yeah. The shot. (laughs) Duh. Um, And, and I talked to um, Zach Milner who covers the draft uh, and he has a database where he tracks NBA threes only at the college level. And even though Walker ended with Houston, like 34%. I don't remember the exact number now. His NBA three number was way worse, like 20 something percent. And so it's just, it's with that in mind, it's not surprising that he shot so poorly, but that does mask a lot of the effective things he did that made him look so good is he shot 34.3% from the field, not from three for on all of his shots and the free throws are not encouraging either. That was below 50%. So actually putting the ball in the basket bad, the process of the shots he generated we're good. And that is encouraging, right? When he was open, he shot it. That's good. And that's what you should do in summer league. But you know, in real games at some point that matters if you can't make them. So it's look, it's four games. Like the sample is super (laughs) small. I'm not going to put that much stock into it. I've seen the most random people never miss out there before, but certainly the efficiency is something he's going to want to work on. And then you saw this from game three to four and game three, when he was the lead ball handler a lot, they were playing the thunder and they were kind of chasing him over screens and, that allowed him to you know, either have his man next to him or he could really read the defense better and make some passes and get to his spots. Then they played the Mavs, and the Mavs ducked under those screens because they knew he wasn't shooting well, and he was way less effective as a driver and decision-maker and shooter in those moments. So, yeah, he's not going to be like running pick and roll a ton with the Pacers for at least a year or probably longer. But in those moments where he is handling a little bit and asked to make a play, if teams can just sag off of him and that really limits his effectiveness, that actually could matter sooner in his career than actually making the shots. And I think that's something he'll have to work on is, you know, whether that's a quick reset, whether that's drilling that long too, he's going to have to get better in those ways to prevent just being totally inept when he is left open. Well, and before, because there was almost a nice transition there, but I want to sit on something. I, I've always thought Jairus' shot takes him a while to get off. It's not necessarily that I think there's anything mechanically wrong with it, but it just takes for a while for him to release oh. it. And it, 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 did it look like that to you? Was it too fast for him? Sort of like he decide like when he catches it, he when he decides he's shooting, like that happens quick. There's no hesitation. But yes, the actual technique of it is slow. And to me, it's because he starts it lower than a lot of guys. Like it starts yeah. at like you know, his chest basically. Like I took I was taking pictures of him shooting free throws mostly because I need pictures of him in Pacers gear. And the first <laughs> one I took, I was like, Oh, wait, <laughs> the ball is below his head. Like the whole ball is below his head, not his arms. So I think that is part of it is just how low he starts 
with on on the catch. And so maybe you want to fix that, especially it's not like he shoots a high enough percentage that you're like afraid to change his form. So maybe they just no, try and, to start him higher. But that I think that's a big part of it. And on, and that's an, probably a more apt point of say the slowness thing I'm talking to because I'd always think you could probably speed up a guy's shot. He's 19, 20 years old, right? Like right. you can speed those things up over the course of time. It's not like it'll never happen. Um, because when left open and he has time to get it off, I, I again, Houston, he did shoot the ball fairly well. Again, obviously different arc and different speed of the game. But back to the segue we almost had a second ago. You mentioned that <laughs> he's not going to do or have to do a lot of this creation stuff in Indiana because of their roster. I mean, they got Tyrese Halliburton signed for a long time now. They also got Buddy Heald on one side shooting. They got Miles Turner down low with some pick and pop kind of options there. Um, they got a lot of guys. Uh, frankly, a t- fairly fun roster, I think, and people are trying to find a team to like get on early with because I don't think people initially have them ranked super high going into the 2023-24 season. What kinds of things do you think will change about Jairus' game and moving into the actual Indiana Pacers? I think that his fir- at first they'll kind of be exploring what that will be because they have so many guys who will be doing stuff with the ball, whether that's Halliburton or Heal or even Ben Matherin, or if you watch Jairus at all in the first two games, it's something like Andrew Nemhard, who was one of the best summer league performers of any team. He'll have the ball more this year for the Pacers. Like there will be guys who handle it. So I think Walker is going to do a lot of screening, especially with the second unit. I think he'll be fine at that. He's, He's like every young kid ever who they don't actually have to set a good screen growing up because they're faster and more athletic, so they just pop out of it really quick and get the ball and make their play. You actually have to make contact in the NBA. I think he will. Uh, but I think it will be a lot of screen stuff where he catches it at the elbow and either can make a pass or make a read or go to the cup from there. I think that's going to be a lot of what his offensive involvement is and also a lot of his impact in terms of the role offensively will be that he elevates their defense and they want to play so fast in transition that he'll just get easy buckets in that way too. I don't think he'll be spotting up that much. I don't think he'll be uh, like in the dunker spot all that much. I think he'll be around the play a lot, but I think that will be more of like, you know, short roll decision-making or rolling all the way to the rim, whatever that may be, because I don't think he'll get much reps just given, like you said, their roster construction is a guy who they're like, throw him the ball, someone set a screen for him, have him make a play. Like, I imagine that at most happens once a game this year. Well, and that's not a terrible, terrible thing. No, do, you I think think, <laughs> do you think it fits in, in comfortably for like a, uh, is he like a 12-minute a game kind of guy, a 22-minute a game? Do what, what, you have any idea? The second one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, so, so they traded for Obi Toppin from the Knicks. Like, they're both clearly fours, especially with the Pacers who have a bajillion centers. So they can't go small as much now. Maybe in the future they can, but not this year. So I imagine he'll play mostly four. If he can guard threes, you can get away with it for a couple of possessions. I don't think they want to do that, but it's, I guess, an option. So I'm imagining he'll play mostly four. And the same things apply to Obi Toppin, who they just got. He was the eighth pick, the same slot, uh, back in 2020. Um, Toppin has had a weird career. We don't need to get into that. But I think th- this is just a rough estimate. But so- basically, they'll share the minutes, right? Like whoever starts plays... 24 to 28 and whoever comes off the bench plays 20 to 24 and that can interchange every game depending on matchups and who's playing well and stuff like that um in general the lottery picks that the Pacers have had under Rick Carlisle Chris Duarte and Ben Matherin were both around 28 minutes per game which is where I thought Walker would be before the OB trade so maybe they just start Jarris and he's the 28 guy and Toppin's the 20 guy but somewhere in that you know 20 to 28 range makes a lot of sense to me awesome and for the fans at home listening you're gonna follow Jarris throughout the year Tony has great stuff going on at Locked On Pace right now. Y'all just did a full, I mean, if you really want to get into the deep weeds on a pod, a full <laughs> hour plus summer league breakdown of what's going on in Indiana and like 20 minutes of it's Jairus Walker. Yeah, we, he's like the guy, right? Like that's what summer league's <laughs> all about is just like seeing how the team views that guy in their context and seeing what he can do in a pro setting for the first time. And Kaylin and I had a, a lots to say about Jairus Walker. She is so good at breaking this stuff down and, you know, really encouraging summer league. So we have a lot of mostly positive things to say as well. Well, I'm sure when he starts, you know, playing well throughout the year, we may have you back on to That's break right. some of it down because he is a ton of fun to watch. We, he, he's only in Houston for a year, but we love the year that he was here. Thank you so much for coming on today, Tony. Uh, good to hear from you again. And, and go Cougs. Right? You got one of us now. Go Cougs. <laughs> I guess I'll say go Cougs. And we are joined by Houston's own Jackson Gatlin. I probably familiar face to me, listeners, but how you doing, Jackson? I'm excited to be here, Parker. Excited to talk a little UH Coog alums, I guess, and uh, break down exactly what we saw out of some of these guys in Summer League. 
Well, so let's jump into it because Nate Hinton played for the Houston Rockets, which you cover on a daily basis very well. And he also played for our Houston Cougars once upon a time. And so I think a lot of people were excited to watch him over the summer league. The first couple games, when some of the big leaguers, Jabari and Tari playing, didn't get in a whole lot. And then once those guys took a seat, I thought Nate Hinton really got to show off. So talk to us, what did you see out of Nate in your coverage of the Houston Rockets in Las Vegas? Yeah, I think two of the most easily transferable skills when you're a guy looking to try and solidify your place in the NBA and make it onto an NBA roster uh, roster are shooting and defense. And I think that easily Nate Hinton was arguably the best defender for the Houston Rockets summer league team throughout the course of the five games, the the regular season, if you will, and in the championship game, right? He made his stamp on that end of the floor, causing chaos, breaking up plays, being, you know, a hard-nosed point of attack defender. And then that generated a lot of easy offensive opportunities, right? Getting out in transition. You saw him really, you know, making his money in the open court. But to me, you know, that type of defensive mentality, I'm kind of surprised, honestly, that Nate hasn't kind of found himself a home at the, or, or a permanent home, I should say, at the NBA level, because that type of defensive grit and mentality is really hard to find in players. And I actually had the chance to cover Nate back when he was playing basketball at University of Houston. And, uh, you know, in the interviews that I had and the games that I saw from there, right, he's he's carried that that chip on his shoulder, that defense first mentality that was instilled in him by by Samson and company all the way up to the level that he's at right now. So I, I think really he has a chance to make an NBA roster. I don't know if it'll be with the Rockets, but some team somewhere is going to take a flyer on him. So let's kind of look at what that role could be, because I agree that, you know, he averaged nearly three steals a game. But when you look at like actual steals in games, because he didn't play so much in the first two, that he, he was a defensive force getting out in transition, long arms in the passing lanes, et cetera. Um, what is a role for a guy like him? You cover the NBA. You also do Locked On NBA on uh, Mondays, Tuesdays. Um, and so what is a, his role at the NBA level? Will he actually fit in somewhere, fall into somewhere, or is he going to kind of constantly be in this back and forth, you think? I, I think you could easily see him kind of adopting a a role similar to like Jose Alvarado for the New Orleans Pelicans, right? Or, you know, maybe for more uh... – familiar territory for Houston fans, a Patrick Beverly-esque role, right? Where neither of those guys had like a traditional route to the NBA. They both had to fight and claw and scrap to, you know, to finally get given a chance at the NBA level. And then once they were given that chance, they also refined their games, right? Pat Beverly was not a guy that was, you know, a renowned shooter before he kind of solidified his role. And then he always made a name with his defense. And then the shooting kind of came later. Same thing for Jose Alvarado. So I think with Nate, Right. He's got the good size. He's kind of a tweener guard where you could, you know, he can guard ones and twos. He's physical for him. It's going to be, can he round out the shooting on the offensive side of the ball to where he's not a liability at that position? Because defensively he gives you everything you would want out of a guard, uh, you know, a, a defense minded guard, a point of attack defender, all that stuff. So I do think there's a world for him at the NBA level where he can just be that pesky kind of nuisance guard. The guy you throw in there off the bench and the other team's best guard is like looking over their shoulder, like, Oh, I got to deal with this Nate guy for the next <laughs> five, 10 minutes, hounding me all across the court. Cause that's the exact type of energy and effort and intensity that he brings every second that he is on the floor. Completely. And it's like you said, it's not, he didn't shoot. He shot 35% from three. He's only shot three of them a game. So it's not like, you know, great. But the defense, I feel like, is going to stick somewhere. I, I'd love for it to be the Rockets, right? That makes my life a lot easier. But I don't, I don't know where it will end up. Um, there is a log jam of talent at the Rockets, though. It's just not that just too many young guys want in one spot, it feels like. You feel like he's going to move on somewhere else? I mean, maybe, you know, the Rockets have one two-way spot left currently that they could give Nate Hinton the spot for and maybe kind of house him with the uh, with the Vipers down in Rio Grande Valley. It's also not a given that Trevor Hudgens and Darius Day is the other guys currently occupying the other two two-way slots since the NBA has uh, moved things around and you can have up to three two-way players now this season. It's not a guarantee that they're going to make the roster either on those two-way spots. So maybe the Rockets shuffle some things around. As it stands right now, now, I would actually love to see Nate Hinton and see the Rockets just kind of take a flyer on him, let him stick around, let him go be in the G League, because if there's ever a point this season where Fred Van Vliet or Amin Thompson or somebody kind of, you know, 
misses a chunk of the season due to injury. You know, obviously we don't want that to happen. But if that were to happen, that's exactly the type of window that you hope to see for a guy like Nate Hinton to get where maybe he steps in and he plays five, ten games here or there and he helps, you know, attribute some, you know, some winning plays in that brief little window that he gets. And that's exactly the type of window that you hope you can get with a player like Nate because then he can kind of showcase himself, if not just to the Rockets, but to the entire NBA. Hey, I'm more than just a two-way guy. I'm a guy that can contribute to winning. And sometimes you just need that lucky break and then you can kind of make yourself an NBA career out of that. For sure. And you'll, you followed the whole Las Vegas Summer League. So you can find, I mean, they finished second in the whole thing. So that's worth following on all things for Locked on Rockets and Jackson. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today, Jackson, talking Nate Hinton, the Cougs, a little bit of Rockets all the way through. Uh, make sure you go find him at Locked on Rockets where you find your podcast. Thank you. Go Cougs. And we are joined by Adam Armbrecht of Locked on Nets to talk about one of Houston's favorites, uh, <laughs> Armani Brooks and his Summer League time with Brooklyn, as well as he just signed a two-way deal. So we're going to talk a little bit about Armani and uh, good news surrounding him. But first, Adam, what did you know? Did you know anything about Armani when Brooklyn signed him for the Summer League? I mean, did you, was it a familiar name at all? Yeah, thanks for having me in. Um, Armani Brooks, I mean, his time with Houston, so he he's played at the NBA level, so he's at least been a name. But as far as a player profile, he's existed on teams, especially with Houston, where they, they weren't going anywhere. So a lot of times, younger players, developmental players in certain organizations get more run at the NBA level than, than they typically would with a you know playoff-level team, with a championship-level team who wants to develop guys in the background. So he at least existed, and he's had – some big performances even at the NBA level. So um, from a Nets perspective, bringing him into camp made sense just from the, hey, you're obviously a perimeter shooter for us. Our backcourt needs some restructuring. A guy worthwhile taking a flyer on at the minimum to get through the summer league. But now uh, on a two-way contract heading into the upcoming season. So in five games in a Brooklyn Nets uniform this summer, uh, he, he scored 18 points a game. He shot over 47% from three on over eight attempts. Like the shooting showed out. Talk about the shooting and then what else stood out for you as you watched him play for your Nets? Yeah, I mean, you know, and it's funny, too, because typically in summer league, um, the structure of the game is not really, you know, a real game kind of setup, right? In terms of we want to kind of run an offense. We want to try to set plays. But this summer for the Nets, it was starkly different than in years past. I actually think after the first game, game and a half, where these are all new players, a lot of new pieces, two rookies playing in there, obviously, in Jalen Wilson and in Noah Clowney. They did start to find a rhythm. So you could look at these guys, specifically Armani Brooks, and say, can he fit what the Nets are trying to do here? You mentioned the three-point shooting. Um, when you take 42 attempts across five games in the summer league, there's enough volume there to say, hey, this is legitimate. Um, and it's interesting because when you go and look at him, so the two, the two stats that I look back to, our first, when he came in 2021 or 2020, 2021, excuse me, he ended up doing kind of exactly two things a couple of years apart with Houston, 20 games, five starts, almost eight, three point attempts per game, 38% from deep. Like the numbers were there. The, the rest of the percentage from the field wasn't so good. And then it just slowly starts to tumble off for him. But then in 22, 23, he bubbles back up with Houston's G League team, 27 minutes per game. Again, eight three-point attempts uh, from beyond the arc and knocking down 38%. So there's like this little sample size that exists with him right now where the question is, can you get back to that thing, right? We got this little sample when you were just getting into the league. Can you recreate that? At a minimum, here in Summer League, he showed that he can be a spot-up three-point shooter, he also did a really nice job of being able to you know, make a couple of moves to create some space for himself on the outside. And when you ask what else did he show, there are also these glimpses of him being able to get into the lane, drive towards the basket. He's not big in a backcourt player, just 6'3", sometimes listed at 6'4". But again, overall, he went 50% from the field too. And he had multiple games, led the Nets, I think three out of the five games here in Summer League, multiple games where he had 15, 12, 15 attempts from the field. So even with all that three-point volume, he was still showing that he could do it in some other facets offensively. Well, and so let's talk about, because I think he played very well. I think you're echoing some of the same thoughts. And he just signed, as of shortly before recording this, actually, a two-way contract, meaning he'll be in the Brooklyn Notes organization next season. Um, they've got an interesting roster there in Brooklyn, kind of moving on from one area into the next and kind of you know ushering in new things. Where does he fit into that? Where does a two-way contract fit into that with all the other big dollar deals you got going on there in Brooklyn? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. The Nets brought in Dennis Smith Jr. this offseason. They also brought in Lonnie Walker IV this offseason. Now, they had guys like Seth Curry going out the door, some other contracts that aren't one-to-one positionally, like Joe Harris, who is a perimeter shooter, though, so you want to replace that functionality. And then a guy like Patty Mills, who wasn't even playing for the Nets basically over the back half of this last season. So the backcourt needs restructuring. I think there's two things about Armani Brooks. One, he has some NBA-level experience, and we've talked about this on Locked on Nets, where you look at guys and you say, well, I could look at a guy from the Nets Summer League, um, no, uh, Jordan Hall, and he's a guard-forward combo, but he's never sniffed the NBA level yet. So if you're going to put a guy on a two-way contract, you want to have some safeguard that if Dennis Smith Jr. had a little injury, he's going to miss some time, right? If someone was going to go down for five or six games, you want to feel like you have that reliable body to pull up. Is Armani Brooks always going to be consistent? Well, that's TBD, but you at least feel like you could bring him in for a handful of games to spell that. Now, the other interesting thing here, too, is we still know the Nets are playing a waiting game when it comes to the Miami Heat, the pursuit of Dame Lillard, and whether or not they could end up with a guy like Tyler Hero. If that happens, then I think what becomes interesting for Armani Brooks is that 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 safety valve could become even more important because the Nets have a guy like Cam Thomas. He's a volume shooter. He's a summer league star. But they have seemed unwilling to commit to giving him minutes at the NBA level. So it seems like the Nets have tried to create a log jam in front of Cam Thomas and also pressure behind him. I think Armani (laughs) Brooks probably falls into that latter category. of Hey, (laughs) if we don't think you're doing enough for us, we do have this other option, especially if maybe he goes out in a trade, Cam Thomas, that is. So Armani does figure into some sort of a plan, I guess, whether or not it's short-term pressure, long-term safety valve. Um, on the two-way deal, I guess there is like a certain amount of games that you can play and this, that, mm-hmm. back and forth. What's the re- I'll get you out here on this. What's the realistic uh, chances you see him in you know, 20-plus games next season? At the NBA level with the Brooklyn Nets, um, at, in this moment, I would say unlikely. Um, it's simply because you just brought in those two new guys in Dennis Smith Jr. and Lonnie Walker. Dennis Smith Jr. was a priority for the Brooklyn Nets. They, they said it. He reiterated it. So you still have Spencer Dinwiddie right now as well. There are some things going on there. I would be surprised if Armani Brooks played 20-plus games at the NBA level, barring a trade coming up here. But that's not a bad thing, though. Like, if you're Armani Brooks, the Nets G League level team, you can play there and continue to showcase yourself. And there's a world where another team comes calling to pull you right up to their NBA roster. So I think the Nets are using him as this safety valve. I think Armani Brooks gets a great chance to continue to showcase what he is. And I'll say my caveat to capping him at 20 games is if he comes anywhere near what he accomplished in summer league from beyond the arc, and it's not going to be 48%, but if he can be hitting 40 plus percent from deep, that will open the Nets' eyes because what the Nets lack at the NBA level right now is scoring. They need more scoring. This could be a very difficult watch at times for a team that is just laden with defensive-minded guys, not a lot of on-ball creators, and certainly not a ton right now of consistent perimeter shooting beyond, say, a Cam Johnson. Dorian Finney-Smith proved that he couldn't quite get there either. Spencer Dinwiddie, not able to do either. Right, So you're, you have a lot of question marks on perimeter shooting. If you can keep pushing that envelope, Armani Brooks, then there is a world where the Nets are going to say, hey, as we maybe clear out some bodies heading towards the trade deadline, it could open up a pocket for him maybe in the back half of this season. Because again, not to go long-winded, the Nets are not in championship mode. So so things are going to move here, right? A Royce O'Neal, a Dorian Finney-Smith, those are front court guys. But things are going to shuffle here. I don't think this team that starts the season will look the same at the end of the season. So you could see back-end potential for Armani Brooks to showcase himself at the NBA level. Armani Brooks, Houston Cougar, showcase him at the NBA level will be a great, great uh, way to wrap up this year for him. Hope it works out. Hope he shoots 48%. I think it'll make a lot of money that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> percent from beyond the arc, and everyone's happy. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for coming on today, Adam. You got it. All right. So that was a fun way to talk about the Houston Cougars and all the uh, really great basketball that so many Cougar alumni got to play at Las Vegas Summer League. Make sure you go check out all of our different Locked On hosts that stopped on to talk today. Really, really happy to have them recap the Summer League experience for us. Also, make sure you hit down, hit subscribe down below. Follow the latest on the Houston Cougars each and every day. We're getting back into Big 12 football stuff as we get ready for the Big 12 football season very, very soon, so you don't want to miss out on any of that. Hit subscribe down below. If you're looking for a second listen today, I've recommended Locked On NBA. I've recommended Locked On all the different shows we've seen, so make sure you go check those out 
they are talking about all the same prospects we are. I promise to make sure you go check out all the Houston Cougar talk, even if it's not intentionally Houston Cougar talk on other channels. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Cougs your first listen day. Locked On Cougs is a pride of my Locked On Podcast Network. That means your team every day. Go Cougs.